Today we're in Romans chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 9. Remember last week we talked about, um, Paul talked about the gifts, how the church operates as the body, how everybody has a certain gift and everybody's supposed to use that gift. And we use those gifts in unison, the church becomes an effective, healthy body. Amen? If you don't use your gift that God's given you, not necessarily your talent, but your gift that God has given you, the church is going to have a weak spot in it. Emmanuel, we will have a weak spot if all of us aren't using our gifts. That's the bottom line. Now, did God supply all the gifts we need within this 40 people here? Absolutely. Absolutely. But if you need to be, if you're not using that gift, you need to be utilizing that gift. So the whole body can be healthy. Amen? That's what Paul was talking about last week, using our gifts. And he follows that up with what we're about to talk about today. Today, I'm just going to focus on how the church is to treat the church in love. How the church is to treat each other believers not non-believers but how the church is to believe and and to treat each other each believer in a very special way and we're going to see that in these few verses here starting in chapter uh, 12 verse 9 read along with me here it says love must be sincere hate what is evil cling to what is good be devoted to one another in brotherly love honor one another above yourselves never be lacking in zeal but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now those verses are just talking to the church. You need to understand that that's the way we're to treat each other. Within, inside these four walls, in our own homes, and how we relate to each other. Now, as you look at the very first thing, he says your love's got to be sincere. How many in this room have ever had anybody pretend to love them in order to get something from them? Pretend to be something to them, to be their friend, to be in order to manipulate you or move you in a certain direction. I think we've all been there, hadn't we? That's why Paul knew 2,000-something years ago that our love has got to be sincere. Don't put on airs. Don't come to church with your plastic face on, with your smiles on, knowing everything's loved. We know it's not. We know Monday through Friday is pure D-H-E double hockey sticks out there, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And you face that. And everything's not lovely in this world. Amen? Everything's not. Things may be lovely about your salvation, safe and secure. Amen? In the hand of God. Amen? Safe and secure, that's lovely, that's all great. But let me tell you right now, I can tell you, I can tell you I'm going to be a prophet for you. I'm going to predict your future. Next week, you're going to have troubles, folks. Amen? You're going to have some troubles. How are you going to handle them? How are you going to handle them? You may even have troubles from a brother in Christ. How are you going to handle that? Our love has got to be sincere. Sincere meaning without any hypocrisy, without any play acting. You don't fake it till you make it in the Christian world, church. You don't do it that way. You start in real life. You start in reality right where you are. If you can't be real in your love in here, how are you going to do it out there? How are you going to do it out there in Walmart when you meet the lost person? How are you going to do it to the unbeliever? How are you going to show them your love? You know, God didn't say they're going to know you by your church buildings, did he? They're going to know you. They're going to recognize you by your programs. No, you're going to recognize you because you all wear suits and ties. That's a lie, huh? Amen? Amen. They're not going to know us by that. How is the world going to know who we are? By our love for one another. If it don't happen in the house, it's not happening out there, folks. And they know it. They know. It. What's the first thing that blows up when a church has a problem? The media grabs hold of it. Man, it's national news, isn't it? Why? Because they love to see us fail. That's something. And I can tell you right now, the American church, which is the only one I've ever been involved in, has failed miserably at these things I just read. Our love, our sincerity, we failed miserably at these things, and we need to repent and get back to what God has told us to do here in order to win a few. Let's put it that way. Just to win a few, not the whole world, but just a few. We've got to line up with these things right here. So love's got to be sincere. Matter of fact, 1 John 3, 18 says, Children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Our love is how we do things. Amen? It's not just flippantly saying, hey, I love you. you know, yep, yep. It's, it's, it's kind of like we're all from Missouri. Show me. 
Show me, stay. You know, show me your love. Show me how it works. And we do. We love in action and deed also. It's four practical ways here the believer can demonstrate his love. Look in those verses. He said, got to be sincere. Number one thing is hate what is evil. How many of you hate what is evil? How many of you hate sin? You know, we're really supposed to be, and, and I'm talking to myself here too. How many of us really hate sin? I don't think we do. I think we hate the consequences of sin. But we love that fleeting moment of sin. The consequences is what we hate. The, what's going to happen afterward when we get caught, when we get this, when we get that. All of what might happen because we did this sin. We're not really fearful of God in this sin. We don't really hate that sin. We hate what might happen if we get caught. And so we just keep on sinning. Trust me, folks, God says, don't hate getting caught. He says, hate the sin itself. Hate the sin. He says, hate it. He says, hate what is evil. Hate it. And we got we to do that. That's the first thing we got to do. We've we got to stand against evil. We don't want to be calloused about it. How do we do it? We stand against, uh, what are some of the things? Believers got to stand against evil. We can fight what? We can fight drunkenness and drugs. Our culture is so wrapped up in that today. We can fight uh, the tongue, cursing and bitterness, filthy language, sexual immorality, all kinds of stuff we need to fight. We need to we look at those things and in, in holy fear reject and say, whoa, no, -uh, no, no way. It's, it's, an, it's a hatred. It's more of a, it's more of a uh, getting away from it, don't want to hang around it type thing. We're not judging those who are wrapped up in it. We just don't want to touch it. We don't want to mess with it. We want to stay away from it. We want to hate what is evil. God does. He hates evil. He hates evil when it attacks us. He hates it when it attacks the lost people. He hates evil all the way around. And he asks us to do the same thing. Our love's got to be sincere and our hate's got to be real toward evil. Not each other. Don't get that wrong. We don't need to just hate everything. You hate what is evil. And then he goes right on and says, you know what? You've got to fight against that thing which is evil. You've got to work against it. Um, James 4, 17 actually says this. Anyone then who knows to, uh, the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, it's a sin. You see, many times we don't count those, do we? We don't check those off say, I knew not to do it, but I did it. I'm not checking that off as a sin. Yeah, and even if you know it, not to do it. That's why, that's why many times as a kid, I, I listen to sermons and say, oh, I don't want to know that truth. And now I gotta, I'm accountable for it, right? When I hear it, I'm accountable for it. When you read it in the Scripture, suddenly you're accountable for it. God says, do not kill. Then suddenly you can't murder, right? You're accountable. It's a sin to do such. And so you do not do that. You can't do not lie. Suddenly lines become a problem for us. Amen? We don't do it or we sin. We dive off into that sin. So he's saying here, you know what? Hate what is evil. Hate that sin. Hate all that it has to do with that. And then the next thing he says here, he says, cling to what is good. The key word there is clinging, not necessarily the good. When you cling to something, that Greek word, the original word, means to be glued to it so tight nothing can come between you. I look at that word, and I know the marriage doesn't say anything about marriage vows like that, about clinging or maybe cleaving, but not the clinging. When a person gets married, when a few people get married, that what does God say? They become one, right? One flesh. They're to cling to each other. Nothing comes between them. It's, such a, it's like super glue. It's so tight a fit, nothing, not even air can get through there, right? And he says what? Cling to what is good. What is good in this life? Love. God. There's a number of things we can start pointing out that are good in this life and we need to cling to what is good hate what is evil and he's saying you got to cling to it in this way that the cling means to be fastened together cemented to it he says cement yourself to it it's in galatians 16 it says therefore as, as we have opportunity let us do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers galatians 6 10 especially to those who belong to the family of believers you see in the book of acts they had it right when you read Acts, you see that the first church was pooling their money to, together. Some of them were even selling lands to make sure the believers in that city didn't go without food or shelter. They weren't living in a commune like you'd think of a, a commune of, of cultish type thing. No, though they were believing God so much for their supply that they were sharing their supply with fellow believers. Not the whole world. You're never going to cure poverty. Trust me on this one, all right? It's always going to be there. God says what? You're always going to have the pure with you. Jesus told his disciples that. But the church within inside the church should never let one of our own live on the street, be hungry. Amen? Never, never. And he says, we've got to, we've got to uh, do that. We've got to be clinging to what is good. We've got to take care of each other, as he says here in this, in this verse there. And then look at the next thing he said, this verse 10. 
Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Devoted meaning to uh, love existing between family. Brotherly love, you know that is phileo, Philadelphia, right? Brotherly love for each other. We just love each other to death. We're just brothers. Now, I don't know about you. I was raised in a family. I had two other brothers and one sister. The sister was so much older. Y'all probably met her. She brought mom down here a couple of times. Uh, she was so much older than I was. She's 10 years. We never did have that connection as brother and sister because I was a baby and she's the grown first one. But me and my brothers, whom y'all never got to meet, especially Hampton and Michael, uh, we would, uh, once in a while we'd get into a tussle, as boys do. And, and it was tough tussles. They weren't just little wrestling matches. I mean, we would beat the mess out of each other. Anyway, uh, Michael on us more because he's the oldest brother. But Hamp was only a couple of years older, three years older than me. And there was times when we'd just get after it. So he'd, he'd chip my tooth one time, knock my tooth out. But we'd get into it so bad. But you know what? That's brother. That's in the family. You let somebody from outside the family come in, guess who's the first one to step up? Right? Right? And, and somebody coming after him, I'm younger, and I'm still like, I'm in it, I'm in it, come on, we'll bow up on you know. And he's older, and he said, you ain't messing with my little brother like that. But then five minutes later, we may be beating a mess out of each other. You understand? That's family, right? Family fights inside of itself. Don't let an outsider come in. We'll join up and gang up and beat the mess out of the outside. The church basically, not shouldn't act the same way, but the church basically is the same. You and I, in Jesus Christ, we're brothers and sisters, aren't we? We may not feel like blood, brother and sister, like our immediate family, but you know what? When it comes down to it, I stand up for you, and you stand up for me, right? If the outside world comes in and attacks, we will stand, right? We won't go, ooh, that, get that one over there. He's the one. Get him. No, we will stand and say we're all united in Jesus Christ, and we stand against this in Jesus' name. We do that. Trust me. I guarantee you. The government walk in the back of this door with their shotguns I and mean, rifles whatever they are, automatic weapons loaded and said, you can't have church today, I guarantee you most, every, yes, we will. You don't come in here and mess with the family, right? And that's what he's talking about here. He said, be devoted to each other in that kind of love, that kind of brotherly love. And he's saying, that's, this is the church. He's just talking about the church loving each other is all he's talking about here. He's not going way out there and making you stretch it out. He's just talking about in the house, in the house. Easy being a Christian here on Sunday morning, isn't it? Amen? So it should be easy to be devoted and loving each other here on Sunday morning. Amen? And Monday we may throw bricks at each other, but hey, it's got to work out through the whole week. Amen? It's got to work through the whole week. Be devoted one to another in that brotherly love. And he commands us this. As a matter of fact, John 13, 34 and 35 says, A new command I give you. This is Jesus talking. He said, Love one another as I've loved you, so that you must, you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another that's the verse i was just talking about a moment ago how does the world how do all men know we are christ because we love one another we are the body of christ here and now and that body can't have dissension among itself it's got to flow together right all the gifts have to flow together and it's all in accord to what he just said in these earlier verses in chapter 12 everything flows together honor one another love one another be devoted in brotherly love honor one another above yourselves now we're getting into the servant part of it, right? Honor others above yourself. Jesus showed his disciples, said, you want to climb the ladder of success in the kingdom of God? Get on your knees. <laughs> That's so opposite of what the world says, isn't it? The world says you want to be successful and climb the ladder? Step on somebody's neck and get up there. Step on people, get over them, climb over them, be successful, work hard, work extra hard. Now you'll we'll get that promotion, you'll get that water. And Jesus says you want to be great in the kingdom of God? Get down low. Get down low where people can use you as a stepladder if they have to. Get down low. And he says, I will raise you up, didn't he? And when you get raised up by God, guess what? You don't come tumbling back down, do you? You don't come tumbling back down because he will take care. If he raised you up, he's got you there for a reason. So he says, honor those above. Uh, uh, make them feel honored above you. Uh, it's interesting, in, even in a church, this honor thing gets gets blown out of report it really is, it's a hard one for people to get used to especially if you're the type of uh, person personality that's like i gotta run things <laughs> it's hard i know it's difficult for you to lay it down and say i give it up. i let somebody else do it because you just got to get in there and barrel like a bulldog through a biscuit you just go at it you know and you got to be in charge of it right well guess what in god's kingdom that's you're the person god says let go you're the one that says open your hands and let go. Quit clinging to stuff. Open your hands and let go, and I'll show you how to be a real leader. 
He said, I'll show you how to do this right. So he's saying here, he says, honor one another. There's been so many church fights have happened over the years because people don't honor one another. They don't honor one another. We're, we're about to observe Lord's uh, communion here at the end of this service, the Lord's Supper, and, and Paul tells us in Corinthians, he says, you know what, don't take of this in vain. Don't take of this with, with animosity toward each other. Don't take of this without recognizing the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Don't, don't think of anything else but Jesus when you're taking this. If you do, you're condemning yourself with it. You're condemning yourself. Why did he say that? Because he knew the church was going to be picky. He knew the church was going to be a bunch of people that would get their feelings hurt. Uh, things would happen like, I didn't get to choose the color of the paint 30 years ago, and I'm mad at so-and-so who's on the other side of the church. 30 years, because they didn't get to choose the paint of the bathroom. Who cares? I didn't get to lead. I didn't get to do this. I didn't get to be in charge. I got pushed aside or overlooked, or somebody didn't pat me on the back at the right time. Who are you serving? Who are you serving? Yourself, your own fulfillment, or the Lord Jesus Christ? See, Paul's dealing with that right here. He said, when you serve, you serve him, you're going to get your reward. It's not about down here, is it, church? It's not about here. We keep wanting to make it here, though. And I, I'm, not, I'm not throwing out the whole thing that we should never appreciate each other and recognize and pat each other on the back and love each other like and say, thank you. Yes, we should. But when the person who is serving or doing the activity demands that they be recognized, demands that they get patted on the back, demands that they get put up in front of everybody and praised over, forget it. You got the wrong preacher here for that, okay? You, I'm not going to do that for you. I'm not going to do that because I'm stealing your reward. Your reward will be that moment when people clap for you. Good job. That's it. It's over. It's fleeting. It's gone. Or do you want a lasting reward in heaven? Do you want an everlasting reward? If you're a soul winner and you've won 10 people this, this week, God bless you. But I shouldn't have to throw your face up on the screen and say, oh, soul winner of the week. Amen? It's, it's kind of like the guy who won the Humble Award in his church. He wore the badge the next week and they took it away from him. <laughs> Same thing. Same thing, folks. Do what you do for the Lord and honor one another above yourself. Now look at 11. 11, he goes into honor here. He's talking about all this kind of stuff happening. And then he goes into service. He said, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor of serving the Lord. There we go, back into the servantship thing. Never be lacking in zeal. Two people are illustrated of this, Paul and Apollos. If you're reading the book of Acts, those two guys, Paul was a bulldog for Jesus, amen? He'd run over you, run through you. He, he had a mission and he had to get it. We were studying that on Wednesday night. As a matter of fact, John Mark did something and Paul says, you're out. Just kick, He didn't want to take him with him. He took Silas with him. He already got ticked off at John Mark about something. Don't know what it was. He said, I'm not taking that boy with me again. And Barnabas said, wait, 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 wait. This is my cousin. I'm a, and they split ways, didn't they? For a little while. But hey, the church grew twice as fast too, didn't it? Not that it was God's will for them to split ways, but I'm just saying, you know. But he took, he took silence with him. But, but Paul was on fire. We call it in Baptist churches being on fire for Jesus. Amen? Don't lose your fire, right? Come back from a retreat. I'm on fire for God, right? I've been in a retreat. I got fired up. And then the cold water committee hits you as soon as you come in, right? The life hits you, doesn't it? The next week hits you. And suddenly all that fire that you felt starts getting quenched and pushed down. And you're like, wait a minute. This verse right here is saying keep that fire going every day. Every day in our life, that zeal to get the gospel out there, to have a moment to, that when God opens that door for us, we'll, we'll jump on it and say, yes, yes, this is gospel. This is God. This is the way this works. And he says there, don't lack in that zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. And he goes into a couple of things here. Be joyful in your hope. Who is our hope in? Jesus Christ. Amen? Be joyful in hope. Uh, think about this. If you're in trial, if you're in affliction, being joyful is kind of hard to do, right? But we have the ability to do so because God gives it to us, first of all, to be joyful in our trials and affliction. But the other part of that is this. One of two things is going to happen in our affliction. Remember this. Number one, either God's going to take it away or he's going to lead us through it. He's never going to forsake us, though, is he? Be joyful. We have a God who won't turn his back on us. When we get into the affliction, when we get into the pain, when we get into the problem, he either says, okay, here's a way around it, or here's the way I'm going to take you through it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, did they go around the furnace? Through it. Who joined them? Jesus, didn't he? 
What Nebi, 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 Nebuchadnezzar say? <laughs> Nebi. When he looked in there, he said, Oh, I see all three of them little Hebrews. I see somebody looks like the Son of God in there. What's going on? And they're walking around like nothing ever happened. Came out of that furnace. What was the only thing that was loose from them? Their bondage. Their ropes were burned off, but their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. I don't know how I got off on that story. But anyway, understand this. Whatever you're going through, God's there with you. He's going to take you through it or around it or out of it, somehow or another. So we have joy in our affliction. We have joy in hope, patient in our affliction. That patient word means not just necessarily patience, but also as we understand patience, but it's also a, uh, um, a, a patient in, in endurance, to being able to endure, conquer our trials. Endurance is hard to do. There's people who run marathons, uh, if I were going to run 26 miles marathon, I wouldn't just go out there tomorrow and do it. What would I do? I'd start getting ready for it, right? Lose about 80 pounds and get ready to run. But the point being is I'd start running, getting my endurance built up in order to run the race. That's all Paul's saying right here. Be patient in your affliction and endure. Show endurance. How are we going to show endurance? We've got to keep working out. How do we work out? We read this right here. We read this right here. We go to prayer and with God and we speak with God and we listen to God and we get empowered by God. And let me tell you another thing. God not only will put you through the trials, he'll also give you the power to make it through. You don't have to do it in the flesh. You don't have to do it on your own. Listen to what Isaiah 41.10 says. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, Isaiah 41.10. And obviously he's talking to the people of Israel at that time, but he's saying, don't fear when those trials come. I'm upholding you. Some of you have a testimony of this. You know when you went through a trial, you went through, there was some supernatural power welling up inside of you helping you to get through it. Could have been the loss of a loved one, could have been whatever, whatever pain, whatever misery has come into your life. You suddenly feel this power bringing you through. That's God's righteous right hand. He's leading you and carrying you through that. And he doesn't just send you off into these things to say, good luck. He sends you off saying, I'll bring you through it. And when you come out the other side, you'll be shining like gold. It's a trial. It's made to make us more like Christ. And Paul says, rejoice in those, folks. God has chosen. He sees you beneficial enough to send you through a trial. We don't look at it that way, though, do we? That's not very much benefit, God. I just soon, you know, ride the small waves and not the big ones here. You know, God, help me through this thing. Don't give me any pain. Don't let pain come into my life. Don't let this come into my life. But God says, that's, that's how I change you. That's how I make you and I mold you. And when you come out the other side, boy, you're going to be shining. You're going to be nice. How do you refine gold? With ice? Fire right? You refine it. You purify it. You get all the dross out of it. You keep, keep pure of a hotter and hotter fire, purer and purer gold. Just think of yourself as a gold medallion going down through that fire, and every time you come out, you're just shiny, and God buffs you out a little bit. Look at this. Look at this. Let's do it again. Yeah. Every time, shines you back out again. But then he says here another thing in verse, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in your prayer. Don't let prayer just be something that you flippantly go by and go do. Make it be a lifestyle. Amen? Make it be a lifestyle. I'm talking to myself, folks, because I get so running fast and checking myself in both ways, and I don't stop. You know what I'm saying? And so you've got to make that prayer. You've got to make that your priority. You've got to get in touch with God and let him get in touch with you. Quiet time. Nothing happening. Nothing happening, and you touch his heart, and he touches yours. And then quickly, in the very last thing, share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. What he's talking about here, obviously, is what the first church did in the book of Acts. They shared each other. They, they gave her their wealth out, and everybody had sustenance. Everybody had clothing. Everybody had food. Everybody had shelter somehow, even to the point of practicing hospitality. Because I want to tell you what, when you became a Christian in the first century church, sometimes you were kicked out in the streets. So we don't understand. We don't realize that. If someone followed the way, if somebody followed Jesus Christ, that Jewish family, that father would kick that child out of the house. You're no son of mine. You're no daughter of mine going to follow that guy from Nazareth. We follow Yahweh, the holy God, and this is what we do, the law of Moses, and this, and this, and this. We don't follow that cult, which is what they thought it was back then. We're not following this. You're going to follow that? You're no son or daughter of mine. And they would literally get thrown out of their families. We don't, see, we don't get that here. We have such freedom and so relaxed in it that 
if we decide we're going to follow Jesus Christ, everybody's like, yay, and, and, and even our lost parents and brothers are like, well, okay, whatever. You know, but they're not saying you're out of here. You know, they're not saying you're out. So, therefore, we don't get persecuted for believing in Jesus Christ, do we, church? No. Somebody may say something bad about it, but you have no idea of what persecution is about yet. As an American church, we have no idea. But the church in the world out there, yeah, they do. Just ask them down in this part of the country or that other country. Or if they're not getting persecuted, ISIS is not taking their heads off all around the world. But not here in Baton Rouge, are they? No, we're not facing that persecution. Somebody might look weird at us or say something or curse at us and something. We think, oh, I'm so persecuted. No, you're not. You're free. You're free to move around. You're free to speak if you want to. But it says here, he says, share with those in their need and practice hospitality. We need to be careful with this, practicing hospitality, amen? Which means like opening your home up to people in need, to the believers in need. Because we live in a day and time, we just don't know. And I'd say on this, and I wrote it in my notes, use discernment. You all have that gift. Use discernment when you're helping people. If you're going to open your home to them in hospitality. We open our homes to each other. Willie's fixing to do it on Saturday night. All the ladies that want to gather up, right, Willie? That's hospitality. That's, that's fellow, we call it fellowship now. But it's hospitality. It's, it's opening your house to people and having them come over and, and, and spreading the gospel with them, sharing with them. And he says, do that. Don't neglect doing that. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 13, 2 says, you know, don't forget to entertain strangers. For by doing so, some people have entertained angels without even knowing it. Now, I've been here for five years. I know none of y'all are the angels. I know that already. <laughs> but if a stranger were to come up, sometimes you might meet somebody on the street, out here, even in Central, that you don't know from Diddley. Nobody knows who they are, and they're helping people. You might be entertaining an angel unaware. I still believe it happens. I mean, the Bible didn't put it in there just saying, you know, good luck with that. You know, it says, this is what happens. Sometimes you don't even know that you're entertaining messengers of God, angels coming to minister and so we need to be careful and, and understand that that we share that hospitality with people in that way so there's some there's some good guidelines just for the church that's all we're talking about this morning i'm about wrapping up just for the church that's some great guidelines just for us amen love and sincerity be real with each other you're having a bad day say things ain't going so good well, let me pray for you minister one to another and then when you leave this building you'll be able to minister out there to those who don't know God. Amen? As a matter of fact, it'll probably make you more bold to practice in here before you get out there. Anybody ever been to one of them witnessing schools, or wind schools, or wild schools, or whatever? Yeah. What did you do before you went out in the streets and started witnessing? You practiced on each other, didn't you? You sat down one-on-one. -on -one. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. You went through the track or whatever, and, you, and, and I did that before. In high school, I led a kid with a wind, a wind program and, and went right there. I went to his house. And I sat there, and I'm, I'm reading just straight through. You know, I'm really theological here. I'm just a 10, 15-year-old kid. I'm reading through the little booklet like that, and he's sitting there looking at me. You know what I'm reading? I said, do you understand what I'm reading? He goes, for some reason, I said, yeah, I do. And he got saved, me just sitting there reading this thing to him. Had the whole Roman road in it and all this kind of stuff. So he said, look, it's your life without Jesus. You see the cross there in the middle? Yeah, I understand that. Okay, let me see it. I just kept on. Man, I was a pro at it, you know. Just read the stupid track and the guy's like, I want that. I want that. He happened to be one of my best friends in high school. Led the kid to the Lord. Reading a track, how to have a full and meaningful life. Just read it to him. Gave him one so he could read along with me. Got through with that. I was like, man, I'm a pro. I'm a professional now. I've won one. You know? yoo -hoo. Hey, it was one more than I had before. But I'm going to tell you what. When that took place, fire, fire started from within. That evangelistic fire. Boy, I said, this is easy. No, it wasn't. It was just easy that time. It was not going to be easy from then on. Amen. Y'all been there. Yeah? It's not that easy from then on. But I tell you what, that first fire, that first spark, man, that gets you going, doesn't it? It's just like getting saved all over again. It's like, man, I shared my faith, and that guy took it. He believed, and he accepted it. He's in heaven now. Poor kid. He got in a car wreck his senior year and died. But he's in heaven. I said, when he died and he passed away, I said, there was just a piece in me. He said, man, I was sitting there and heard him pray. But I heard him receive Jesus Christ. I know where he's at. And because I was obedient and reading a little old track, not being real theological and real, like, I just read it to him, and the boy received Jesus Christ. And prayed to receive Christ. And Steve, for, for right now, is Bushner, Steve Bushner's up there. He's, he's there. 
because I was obedient to read him a track. Simple, easy. Didn't even have to know the Bible, just read the track. And it happened because the Spirit was ready to move on his life. It's not that hard, folks. Share with God's people, those who are in need, and practice your hospitality out there. First, begin in the house, amen? And then take it outside. Take it out. If you don't know how to pray for people, start in here. Start in here. Patty can teach you how to pray for people. She's got a master's degree in it. <laughs> she can pray. There's a lot of you here who know how to pray one-on-one -on -one with people. If you're scared to do that, get with these masters, and they'll teach you how to do that. Nothing to it. Connie's a master. She's a doctorate degree, isn't she? She's got a doctorate in it. Yeah, exactly. People have advanced in their prayer life. But I'm telling you, you've you got the abilities in this church right here with us, 40-some-odd people, to learn all the things we need to learn what Paul's talking about right here and how to take it outside this building. That's why you learn it, not to do it in here, but to do it out there, amen? That's why we do it, amen. So I encourage you with those words today. Follow that, church. That's all for us, and it's all about us in these verses, right? It's not about the outside world. We'll get to that next week. It's all about us in this room. Those verses, go back home, chew on them, reread them, and say, God, help me do it. God, help me do it, because I know you got to be struggling because I struggle with it, Amen. You, too, have to be struggling with that, even our walk with him and how we love each other and trust each other and work with each other through our gifts, as Paul says here. I want us to move straight on into this. We're going to... All to Jesus, I surrender.